What's up, everybody? This is Jay Martin, investor and CEO of Cambridge House. And my guest today is Anthony Malowski, the founder of a company called Carbon Advisors. Anthony is an investor in the carbon markets. Uh, his background is in the commodity sector. He transitioned as carbon being a primary focus about three years ago. The purpose of this interview today, this is the first of a short series that I'm gonna do where I'm sitting down with a variety of experts from the carbon market so that I can understand the basics and the fundamentals better. I need to understand this market because it's emerged very quickly. Maybe like you, I'm getting pitched a new carbon deal at least once per week right now, and I can make the assumption that most of them are garbage because that's what happens when these cycles begin to emerge, right? A lot of hustlers start arriving with their, their new can't miss investment opportunity, and I'm seeing tons of that right now. So what, I, what I'm doing right now is endeavoring to determine how to value good versus bad, uh, and really understand the basics of this market. And so if you're looking for an introduction to the carbon market, this is a good interview to watch. If you're wondering what a carbon credit is, this is a good interview to watch. If you're wondering why the carbon market exists and what may sustain it, uh, or not, this is a good interview to watch where carbon credits come from and whether or not this market actually makes a positive impact on the environment or if it's just capitalists having fun, this is a good interview to watch. The first of a short series that I'm gonna do. So I hope you enjoy this one. Now, three things before you watch this interview. Number one, this YouTube channel now generates a decent amount of ad revenue, which I didn't see uh, coming when I started the channel, but it does now and that's just great. So what I've decided to do with that cash is donated to an organization that is super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas and then provide them with supportive housing and career training and just generally positive influences on their life. I love what they do. Check them out if you're interested. Number two, uh, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. And number three, uh, I publish a weekly newsletter. It's free. It hits the uh, hits the wire every Friday. I love writing it. It's probably the favorite thing that I do. I talk about what I'm doing in the market, what I'm watching in the market, or just things I'm thinking about and I'm seeing and I want to share some thoughts on. So uh, there's a pinned comment right beneath this video where you can subscribe and I'd love to have you join the team. So here's my interview with Anthony Malowski. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. This is Jay Martin. All right, what's up guys? Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined right now by Anthony Malowski, an investor, the founder of Carbon Advisors, and the chairman of Nickel 28. Anthony, it's great to meet you. Yeah, great to meet you, Jay. Thanks for having me on today. I'm looking forward to this, actually, because um, I feel like the carbon market is something I'm hearing about every day. I'm getting shown a new deal at least once per week, and I feel that most of the promoters who are showing me these deals don't know what they're talking about. And so, I'm hoping today we can like dive into some of the basics uh, of the carbon market for my own benefit uh, and then m many other things. So for anybody who's not familiar with yourself, though, and, and what you do, why don't we start there? How do you spend your time, Anthony? Yeah. So, you know, I started off my career at a hedge fund in New York uh, and then later at a private equity fund. And, uh, you know, at some point I decided like like all entrepreneurs, I wanted to do it myself. And, and um, you know, the first 15 years I was just investing in commodities ranging from copper and gold all the way to oil and, and cotton and, and carbon and everything else. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of view myself as an investor focused on commodities. And in particular, for the last seven or eight years, I've been really focused on decarbonization and really a transition to a greener future. And that's meant cobalt, it's meant nickel. And about two and a half, three years ago, um, I started trading carbon and I uh, was one of the founding uh, members of of carbon streaming. That's companies now run by, by Justin Cochran, and I'm not involved in management, but I, I was one of the founders there. And then, uh, you know, started trading and maybe have one of the largest retail trading books in the voluntary markets, uh, maybe even in the world. Um, we also founded uh, Carbon Advisors and uh, Global Carbon Credits. So we've kind of been pretty active now for the last three years in the carbon space. And that's really an extension of our views around this transition to kind of a decarbonized greener future. And, and really, in my view, um, this transition is the catalyst for a bull market in a variety of co commodities, like including nickel, including copper, cobalt, and carbon as well, which is maybe the most interesting. And it's the one that I, you know, at this time, I have the largest position in. Why, talking about why it would be a catalyst for a bull market in other commodities, what do you mean by that? 
Look, all these technologies um, and all these changes that we're making to uh, combustion engines or to the electric grid, you know, they require metals. Um, you know, if you think about our electric grid, that is highly copper intensive. And in some parts of America, that is 100 years old or nearly 100 years old. And so, you know, you've got to effectively rewire America and not just America, but the world really. And that is massively copper intensive. If you want to talk about uh, moving away from the combustion engine towards electric vehicles, uh, notwithstanding, you know, your views on batteries, this and that, it, it doesn't matter. All those batteries take lithium, they take nickel, they take cobalt. So this transition will have a very material impact on, uh, on basic materials and, you know, you know, different ones in different ways. And of course, in different time horizons. And I think that's important for retail investors to understand that, you know, these waves are going to kind of come ebb and flow and, um, you know, they should be thinking about each particular metal in its own context. So what I mean by that is the supply and demand dynamics on the man, demand side might be similar, but on the supply side, they might look really different. And so uh, I think if you take a really high level, you got to be thinking about this transition. But you know, as an investor, you, you can't say that a high tide is going to float all boats here. And you really need to look at each particular metal uh, <clears throat> because there is that ability, of course, for supply side response. It's going to be differentiated based on you know, the particulars. Yeah, that's been the hardest part from my perspective is differentiating between where the value is. Because if you look at, we, I mean, I've seen like many hype cycles and a lot of the metals that you just described, like lithium, for example, was, you know, uh, massively hyped a couple of years ago that we discovered that it's actually super abundant and maybe is not the best place for capital. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. And then, you know, like cobalt, for example, maybe the opposite, right? Super critical metal utilized for batteries, turns out super tough to get pretty much in a few locations that aren't easy to access. And so it can be engineered out. And so again, you know, as a consequence, I've really stuck to like the copper and maybe the nickel narrative uh, because it's, I feel like two metals that are just going to be steadfast. But what do you think about that? Yeah, no, there's, there's no question that I think safe. But look, like let's take nickel and copper. Like first nickel, uh, nickel has, um, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar capex uh, supply side response, meaning a new nickel project sitting in Canada or, or in Australia is going to take billions of dollars to, to bring online. So that means once you get through the brownfield expansion projects, you really hit a wall where you need billions of dollars of capex to expand. So that has a really interesting supply dynamic. Uh, copper is the same way. Now, the one thing I would say about both of those metals that's really important to think about is they're kind of proxies for GDP growth, which means even if you have electric vehicle growth, if you have just a complete shutdown of the building industry in China and, and 7%, I'm just making up a number, of copper consumption in China uh, is decreased, then you know, it, it may be the case that copper is not interesting. So you, that, I mean, that's one of the challenges in particular with copper and nickel is that because they're so critical to just and really proxies for global GDP growth, that even though you know, factually, they are going to massively benefit and there's going to be tremendous pressure on them in the coming years from electrification and a transition to decarbonized economy. I think it's very challenging to predict the exact moment. And so take copper, you know, um, I think if you're going to own copper, you cannot just be jammed into micro cap stocks. I think you have to own like a first quantum as well. So, so that you are able to have liquidity, you're able to trade around it. And I think, mm. you know, for retail investors, when you're thinking about these, um, these names out there, what you really need to do is construct a basket that, that has big liquid names in it, like a first quantum, we're talking about copper. And then you go down through and you have more speculative names like a US copper or you know, a Nevada copper. I mean, these are very speculative, very risky, big reward, but you also need to layer in those first quantums, which are also proxies for copper, but they're very liquid. And so I, you know, when I think about any particular metal, if I have a view on that metal, uh, I never just buy a single name. Like I just don't do that. If the driver, I mean, there are situations where you have a particular view about a company based on geology or something. That's different. Right. Right. We're talking about macro investing in copper, for instance. I think it's critical for retail investors to put together a portfolio of different stages. Um, now, sure, your friend might get lucky and pick a microcast stock that goes up 10 times, whatever that happens. But if we're talking about investing sensibly, in, in these names, it's really critical, I think, to layer in different stages, you know, in that process. And um, that's particularly true, I think, of nickel and copper, just because they're proxies for this bigger global economy. Whereas if you take cobalt, fine, cobalt is 
linked to jet engines. But you know, today um, the demand for batteries is so significant that that's a major driver. So cobalt has a little different dynamic. But but for the big base metals, um, having that multi kind of layered approach, portfolio approach is really important. Okay, I wanna I wanna use that as a segue because you're right, and I agree with everything you said in regarding to investing sensibly. And yeah, your buddy may pick the ten bagger. Good for him. Maybe you will too, right? But you know, you only yeah. get that by the way. You know, it's just probability, right? And and so frequently, I find that retail investors and i fall victim to this we're so focused on picking the winner right and you can't in the, in the spec markets you can't really pick a winner you can have a good feeling about a winner but what you can do better i feel is eliminate the losers right eliminate the 80 to 85 percent that are definitely not worth your time and then increase your probability of landing on those those five ten baggers but the work comes with knowing what to just get off your desk Right. What does it also, and and also like, and also I think retail investors in particular <clears throat> investors that are focused on the resource sector, don't forget ETFs and, and like, look at gold. Okay. There are a million gold companies out there, but you know what? I'll tell you personally, I own the GDXJ because I'm so busy. I'm focused on base metals. I'm focused on carbon. I don't have the, the kind of time to get into the details of all these gold companies. And so I own the GDXJ and, you know, too often people overlook that, but I can tell you, on the average, it is exceptionally challenging to beat the index. And so if you have a view around inflation and gold, that's one of your views this year, which I think is going to be Ben Silver, is going to be a popular view this year. Mm. Um, once again, yeah, you could pick you know, some beaten down company, get it right and, and fine. But I, I think don't forget the value in an index like the GDXJ, like there's tremendous value in it and liquidity. You know, the other thing here about mm. you know, retail investors that I think you should always remember is... Um, Liquidity is, is really important and, you know, there's value in liquidity and uh, being able to come in and out of the GDXJ every single day of the year, every single trading day is a fact. Being able to get in and out of like a penny stock gold company, you know, it's not always a fact. And I'm not saying, I mean, by the way, I invest in these. So let's be clear about that. But sure. uh, what I am saying is sometimes uh, I think that um, you should say, I'm going to invest $50,000, whatever, 20000 10000 and then divide that across, you know, the GDXJ if we're talking about gold now, and a couple other, and maybe a barrack, and then layer in your penny stock because I think that's just a safer way, and that basket approach uh, is a safer way to still have that exposure, but not kind of go all in on something. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Now <clears throat> I want to pivot to the carbon market a little bit. Um, you know, if you were there two and a half, three years ago, I would call that early considering today, it seems like, well, like I said, I'm, I'm getting pitched carbon deals left, right, and center, uh, and there's an absolute wave of interest. I often find when these waves hit Anthony, that investors get really excited because, you know, a couple of deals do well and, and they see money flowing in that direction, but often the fundamentals are misunderstood. So I'd love to just back up a little bit with your help and understand the carbon market from the basics, right? So why don't we start with that? What is the carbon market? If somebody were to yeah, ask no, you- and So this is a really critical question that you should gotta understand. There are two carbon markets. There's the regulated carbon market and the voluntary carbon market. Okay, the regulated carbon market is literally the government of California, by way of example. Yeah. The European Union, by way of example. This market trades like water, okay? and Frankly, most, uh, most individual investors, retail investors, really can only access that market through ETS. Um, you know, KRBN, which is a big US exchange traded ETF, will give you exposure to EAUs, which are the European emission credits and the California credits and some other credits. And that's just a proxy for those markets. Now, uh, to be clear, those regulated markets trade on political dynamics, right? I mean, like you're talking almost about a legal fiction here. And so um, em emitters inside of a jurisdiction are required to offset the carbon footprint by law. And so they enter and exit those markets along with speculators. That is not the market every one of the deals that you see is talking about and the deals I've been involved in and even the credits that I trade. We're talking about the voluntary market. The voluntary market is the market that when you go and buy an airplane ticket and you check the box and for $7.95, you can offset your carbon footprint, you have voluntarily offset your carbon footprint. When you see that some major corporation has said that they're going to be 
net zero by 2030, carbon neutral by 2050, they're voluntarily offsetting their carbon footprint. So the key distinguishing point here is regulation. Voluntarily, they're volunteering, regulated, it's regulated. Now, I would argue that a voluntary commitment is no longer voluntary once it's made. And what I mean by that is uh, every single company on the S&P 500 that I'm aware of has some sort of commitment as part of their ESG policy, right? Mm. And, you know, the Black Rocks of the world can't own you if you don't have these ESG policies now, the Yale endowments. And so what's happening is they are voluntarily entering into commitments around decarbonizing, but ultimately those commitments are becoming required for shareholders to own them. So that's, those are two very different markets. So within the voluntary market, all of the deals you're seeing are addressing the voluntary market because there's no real need to address the regulated market. That, that trades like water. I mean, Morgan Stanley alone trades 50 to $100 million a day of regulated credits. Mm-hmm. That's just more, you know, so, so that market is not interesting to your investors. The deals that, that we're seeing are voluntary credits. So what exactly is a voluntary credit? Well, that market kicked off maybe over, over a decade ago now, and it was a train wreck when it kicked off. Uh, and not dissimilar to your analogy with lithium, you know, they spike, they fade, and then they spike again. So it kicks off and there's fraud and, and everything happens. People say, uh, I've got a ton of carbon here. I've got a forest in Namibia, whatever they say. And um, some of it works and some of it doesn't work. And from that experience has emerged what today is a much different system. And, and the system today is a system of, of um, standards. And so when you talk about a metric ton of carbon, you're talking about a metric ton of carbon everywhere in the world. And you know there are a couple of different standards. I think the key standard is VERA. It's a registry. We'll talk about that in a minute. I think something like 86% of all newly issued credits in 2021 were VERA. There are some other standards, like one called gold standard would be another example. And then there are a couple smaller standards inside of the US. Now, these standards are important because uh, if you are a buyer of a credit, in order to understand what you're buying or in order to feel comfortable about what you're buying, that credit needs to be uh, verified through a registry. So what does that mean? Uh, Let's pretend that you have uh, 50,000 acres of land that's been clear cut. And uh, like we can, there's a bunch of levels here, but it's been clear cut and you want to um, get carbon credits for that land. Well, you can put together a program with scientists, probably will take you a year to figure out if you reforest that land, if you ride a conservation easement on that land, um, you know, what will be your annual carbon capture over the next 40 years? And then each year you'll be able to issue credits. And that process, if we started today on that 50,000, that hypothetical 50,000 acres, you probably would not get your first credits for three to five years. Okay. Um, That is called a nature-based solution credit. And in order to do that, you would be submitting these documents to Vera. They would be verifying it. And that in that way, when a consumer of the credits buys the credit, they're buying a Vera credit, a Vera registered credit, they have uh, an understanding of what they're getting. And so that standardization is really a result of what was pretty negative experience 10 or 15 years ago. And there are different kinds of credits. There are uh, credits like I've just called, uh, talked about, which are nature-based solutions. Um, in other words, you know, you're kind of doing something in the environment, using the environment to create that carbon credit. But you know, there, there are other types of voluntary credits as well, like credits that come from you know, switching fuel types or credits that come from hydroelectric dams or, you know, any of a number of things. And, you know, it's interesting because if you looked at, there's a website, um, uh, carboncredits.com, I think is the name of it. And if you look on that website, you're going to see a bunch of different carbon credit pricing. And it could be confusing because each one of those credits is probably very registered, Mm -hmm. but it's trading at a different price. And so why is it that a one metric ton of carbon is trading at a different price. And one of the key uh, key reasons for the differentiating in price for these credits is something uh, called co-benefits or you know the ability to market what you've done. So if you're an airline, let's pretend you're Delta Airline and you need to, and you need to offset a thousand credits. This is not a real number, but a thousand credits next year. Um, 
you might go and for 20% of those credits, you might pay a massive premium. So uh, Carbon Streaming, they have a project called Rimbariah. It is definitively the single best very registered credit in the world. Those credits trade between $14 and $17 today. And you know they've uh, prevented deforestation for palm oil, and there's an orangutan sanctuary. And so if, if you're buying that credit as a, an airline, you're buying that credit and you're paying $16 or $17 for that credit for the ability to market it and show what you've done, right? But with the balance of your credits, what you likely will end up doing is and I'm not speaking for any particular company, but what you likely end up doing is buying less expensive credits, like less charismatic credits. And so the big delta on these credits is their charismatic value. In other words, their ability for the underlying company that's buying them to market them. But within the portfolio at a given company, you typically have this Mm -hmm. kind of split between uh, charismatic credits and then regular credits. Mind you, each credit, no matter what you pay for it, only offsets one metric ton. But part of this is a marketing exercise. Let's just kind of be clear about that. And so, you know, that's a really important thing to understand about about this process. So if you see any deals, like just a a warning right now to anyone, if you see a a carbon deal and you ask them where are these credits going to be registered and they tell you, oh, they don't need to be, like that is a massive red flag. Like the value in the credit comes from the accreditation agency. That's very critical if you're watching this. Okay. The key one is Vera. Gold standard is another one. But, but uh, I know of a couple of deals that I've seen in Africa where they talk about, you know, they might be able to trade into exchange in the future. <laughs> That's all fine and well, but there is no value in that credit until it has a standard because being registered with that standard means they went through the scientific process and then, you know, kind of the validity. It's almost like listing on an exchange if you think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you there. Okay. So, <clears throat> so... So that's an important differentiation back to uh, the uh, yes, mandatory carbon market and the voluntary carbon market where the opportunities lie. The reason the voluntary market exists is because companies are getting social pressure to operate better. And as a consequence, companies like BlackRock now have mandates to own only companies that have some kind of credit infrastructure in place, right? Carbon credit infrastructure in place. And first of all, like, what's the likelihood? I mean, when I hear voluntary market, I think, okay, well, if we weren't hitting new highs, you know, every day, like what, what happens in a bear market, right? Can BlackRock backpedal on this and say, you know what, we can't afford to be so strict on these policies right now. We need to make money. The market's not as easy as it was last year. And could this reverse in any way? What do you think about that? Well, clearly, if you look at history, uh, people care less about pollution. <laughs> In a bear market, like exactly. that, that, yeah. that just actually that's the case, right? You know, I, I feel that um, if you look at BlackRock, BlackRock's own, I'm, we're talking about BlackRock, but really BlackRock is a proxy for 50 firms, right? Yes, yes. Um, yes. Like their ownership of coal and and all these things, I don't think that they're going to backtrack on that. I think what's more likely is through time, um, this is going to evolve. So I'll give you an example uh, of an outlier, Apple. Uh, along with Goldman raised something to the tune of $300, $350 million last year because they don't want to buy carbon credits. Um, they want to buy their own forest and manage it for carbon. So that, that's an example of a really big company kind of stepping outside of the system saying, we want to do it our own way. Um, so I think, I think through time, what you're going to see is different companies. And Microsoft has a really great white paper about this. Um, you're going to see you know, different companies doing it really differently. But here is an important note for speculators and investors on this. So if you look at the price of regulated carbon in Europe right now, the EAU, it's trading at like 89, 90 euro. I don't know, 88 today. I don't have it on my screen right now. And if you look at the voluntary market for carbon, um, the best credit, the Rimbariah credit trades is somewhere like 16 or 17 bucks. But I would say the average price in the market is $8 right now. Okay. And okay. if you if you think about this, no one really cared. Then everyone cares kind of starting a year ago. And you you have no supply because there's a supply lag. It's just like a mine. Like there's kind of a three to five year supply lag here. And so you have, I think, tremendous pressure on on the voluntary market in the coming two or three years. It's going to push that market up towards a convergence with the regulated market. And what's interesting is, you know, I've read 
uh, that if you were to meet all of the obligations, the voluntary obligations to offset carbon footprints today going forward, you would have to reforest all the arable land on the earth multiple times. Like, that's not happening. Let's just be clear. That's not happening. Hmm. Um, so what that means is mechanical carbon capture has to come into play. Uh, mechanical carbon capture probably doesn't work. I mean, the earliest it works is 60 to $80. It probably doesn't work until like $150. And I, mean, I think what that, what that tells us is that, you know, the carbon price still has quite a ways to go until it catches up to a point where uh, it reaches kind of an equilibrium. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. No, 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 that's great. No, I want to, I want to, I definitely want to dig into that, what mechanical carbon capture is prior to that. I just want to back up a little bit. So for investors who are curious about how to do like basic diligence, the first question you should ask is who's verifying these credits. If a company's you look into the deck and they're saying, this is our business model right away, you can look at a Vera or a gold standard. But if somebody there's some red those that you i mean honestly if i if it's my money personally like if i'm and i, I can tell you I've a lot of checks even in some of the deals you're talking about it mm -hmm. one it has to be vera or gold standard like okay. and if they tell you anything else like honestly red flag and i'm sure some hostler will tell you some grifter will tell you why their thing works but um literally i would just that is the biggest red flag if they don't have it and and also i, I would um i would also be really interested in the team that's going to take, it's just like all these commodity deals. I'd be really interested if I was the investor and asking, has that team ever taken a project through the verification process, right? Like every dude in Vancouver is going to show up with a shell and $5 million in a carbon deal in 15 minutes. We know that's going to happen. Sure. They're all going to zero except for 10% of them, right? Because these guys don't know what they're doing. I mean, this is a real thing. And, um, you know, you need teams of people who have done it before. So, and, so my uh, question for you, I was looking at deals, I'd evaluate them in that way. Yeah. Well, that makes complete sense. And that's essentially what I wanted to, to get here. So my, my follow-up question is, and maybe you answer this is yes. How hard is it to create a new carbon registry? Right. And maybe that's why you said it has to be very a gold standard for you, but could some cowboy, you know, who regulates the registries? I guess. No, look, you and I can sit it right now and just say, we just came up with the magic carbon registry. Like that's okay. who there it is. Yeah. Like, but is, is Delta Airlines going to buy from you? Is Goldman Sachs going to buy from you? No. no. Like, so remember, um, you know, the ultimate buyer of these credits, the corporates that are buying these credits are big institutions. And this is important. They have voluntarily submitted to the regime, which means they want to take exactly zero reputation risk. Does that make sense? Like if they buy a credit and like, they don't want to hurt their reputation, it, you know, so um, they're not taking any risks here. When they buy credits, they want to take no risks. They, they volunteered to do this. How stupid do you look? If you volunteer to do something, then you buy some scam credit. Like that's a, that's a bad program if you're Coca-Cola, right? So the buyers of these credits are exceptionally conservative. And I would also think about this when you're looking at what deals you want to back and not back. Yeah. Um, the buyers of these are like the most conservative nine to five, don't hurt the company reputation, 27 lawyer involved kind of thing. And so um, there are going to be big winners and, and not, it's not going to be just carbon streaming. There's going to be a bunch of winners, but um, I'd be very reticent to put money into an inexperienced team that's, you know, trying something really new and, and weird. Yeah, yeah. No, but okay. That gives me the clarity I need because what I want to provide my audience is how do you get to the no real quick, right? And so once again, if, if XYZ company shows up with their new registry that you haven't heard of yet, but trust me, these are verified. Anyway, we covered that. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. Now I want to get- yeah, the other, you know, if, if someone comes to you, the other thing is time, okay? So, you know, it's just like the guy that shows up and says, I'm going to build this mine in two years. Don't worry about permitting. You know, we've all heard that story, right? Okay. It takes time to get these credits verified. And, and remember, like, just because they're verified doesn't mean you get them. So if you plant a tree, like, you don't get those credits, like, the day the tree is planted, right? So, and I'm using reforestation, but there's other types of credits. You know, you, you got to understand, like, if, if you start today, if someone comes to you with a pitch deck today with a dream and a vision, like, they're probably not getting credits for three to five years, um, and, and that's sort of just a really, now, of course, they're coming nuance. They could be investing in an advanced project, but I'm just, I'm just warning people that, um, that verification project is it's backlogged right now. There's a lot of projects in the pipeline. Um, and they're, they're like, if you think about Vera and gold standard, 
they're basically a reputation. The whole thing is predicated on their reputation, which means they are exceptionally conservative. So where I'm going with this is if you're looking at a deck, think about those timelines and really question them and, and, and just add a hundred percent, add double whatever they're telling you in terms of like delivery of credits. Cause really like, like that is money. that it's really important point. Otherwise they might get the credits. It just might take them three or four years. Nothing wrong with that, but it might matter for the market performance and the share performance. Okay. Okay. I appreciate all that. Now, another thing you talked about was the charismatic value of credits, which um, again, like seems, it kind of raises my spidey senses a little bit because it seems very ambiguous, right? Like, but, uh, but it is what it is. So let's dive into this a little bit. The price, if I heard you right, the price is determined by the charismatic value being the marketability, right? That's what no, the premium, the premium is. So, so, so the, the, the credit, like just, if you look on the average right now, a carbon credit, uh, is trading for around eight bucks. Okay. Sure. And, and, um, and, and, and two things can impact the value, the vintage. In other words, the year that cre- it was created, the older the credit, probably the less valuable it's worth. So the okay. vintage, we call that vintage. And then also um, the marketability of it. And that is purely determined by the supply and demand value of the market. And so if I was looking at a project and someone said to me, this is going to be a charismatic credit, I would, I would give that no value because the only person that can tell you if that's a charismatic credit is Delta Airlines, right? Like, like to actually truly understand those premiums, you have to see the credit trade. So like if I was evaluating a new project, I would use the average carbon price because if you get re- if you get verified, you will get the average price. Okay, that that would be my baseline. Like if I'm you doing an MPV model or some kind of model, I would use that base price. I would not I would not roll in the premium price because like you don't know, no one knows what the premium will be, and like that premium, I think frankly will change through time. Uh, an example of that is vintage. I touched on it briefly. What is vintage? Vintage is the idea that um, you should offset your carbon footprint with carbon credits that were created in the same year. So, and, and by the way, it's not feasible today. That's just not feasible because that like there's a misalignment between creation of carbon credits and carbon footprints, but there's that idea. Um, and so I just use that as an example that I think that through time, what kinds of credits will trade at a premium will also change. For instance, blue credits, credits created from doing something in the ocean. Mm. Massive premium today. If, they, if you can even get them, what will happen through time? Who knows? So when you are evaluating a project as a retail investor, I think you should 100% just use the average carbon price okay. and think about that premium as a potential, but don't, don't get hustled on it because that, that, that um, Howe Street guy has no idea. He just heard about carbon six weeks ago for the first time. and has no idea if that premium is actually going to be achieved or even achievable, in my opinion. I love all the Vancouver references you're bringing up here. <laughs> I can make Toronto as instead if you want. <laughs> you just said you're a Vancouver. <laughs> no, I get it. It's a reputation that uh, Vancouver worked very hard to earn. So um, well, I, mean, I, lo- I love Vancouver. I, got, anyway, <laughs> I, I just, I just think you know we're talking to retail a retail audience here. I just think that they should be um, careful. And and you know something that's really important for the retail audience here to understand is so if we looked at the price of the average carbon credit, right? That the credit that's trading at eight bucks today, that credit might have only been trading at a dollar 14 or 16 months ago. And what happened was a token called Klima DAO came into existence. And what that token did is it bought up a roughly 14 million metric tons of carbon and it retired the credit. So I didn't touch on this, but this is important. You're a company, J, J company, right? And your carbon footprint is 100 credits a year. If you go and buy credits, you have not yet offset your carbon footprint. You do not offset your carbon footprint until you retire the credits. Does that make sense? So you've bought your 100 credits. Now you've retired them. When you retire a credit, it means that credit is no longer, you can't sell it on. You can't do anything with it because you've retired it to extinguish your carbon footprint. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. It, 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 until you retire it, you're just a speculator, right? Sure. It's the equivalent of buying copper and then using it or something. And so what Klimadow did is it came in and about roughly 14 or has to date roughly about 14 million uh, metric tons of carbon. And it really cleared out a huge inventory of carbon and it retired those. So if you look at um, Sprott Uranium Trust, 
you know, even though Sprout Uranium Trust is taking uranium off the market, ultimately that physical uranium is still sitting somewhere and can be used someday, right? Yeah. If actually it can be. What Clean Dow did that was different is that it bought all these credits and then it retired them so that they can't, you know, sell them on to someone to offset their carbon footprint. Uh, so that's a little bit of nuance here, but it's important because one, it shows you how a credit is extinguished or retired. And two, it kind of gives a, a little bit more background too on why there's been such a dramatic move in addition to interest from corporates. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I want, I'd love you to dive into Carbon Streaming Corp's business model. And so walk my audience through, I mean, most people that watch this channel who have been paying attention to the carbon market are familiar with the name, right? And probably have yeah. seen it. You know, so, I, I'm not the best. I mean, Justin, the guy who runs it and that team would be better positioned to do that. I just I'll tell you, I've just invested in it. Um, but, you know, the way I understand it is they do exactly what Franco, Franco does, Franco Nevada. I mean, to a T and, and, you know, they've deployed and raised a couple hundred million dollars. So um, I, I could easily introduce you to Justin and maybe you should have him on here because he would be better positioned to do it. But it's, I think it's kind of that pay forward, receive the credits and, and split some of the upside model. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah, I think it'd be better to get them on here to really walk through it, but that's, you know, that's the basic model. Okay. Yeah, no, and I, I definitely take you up on that intro for sure. I'd love to have Justin on. Um, so talk to me about global carbon credits. Yeah. So I think, you know, what we're doing, we've raised about 50 or $60 million and we're creating what, what would be called like a, a Sprout Uranium Trust. I mean, maybe we should be called the, the Carbon Uranium Trust. What we've done is just bought uh, a huge basket of carbon credits and, you know, you're going to have all your, and we'll be public trading on the NEO in another four or five weeks. You know, there's going to be a ton of names out there. And, um, you know, I like to have beta. In other words, if the whole space moves, I like to have some names that move. And so my idea is high tide is going to float all boats. You know, as we trade at a premium, we'll buy more credits and it'll, it'll help the price of carbon. And I think um, it'll help all the names in the space. And so, you know, I think that we'll be an ally of every single one of these companies out there because all, all we're doing is just buying credits and holding them. Uh, and we bought a pretty significant amount, maybe even one of the larger holders in the world at this point. And, um, you know, we'll be public on the NEO, hopefully in the next uh, quarter or so. And that will be, I think, a name for retail investors to hold and, um, you know, be part of the basket, right? So, you know, if you think about Justin over at, at um, Carbon Streaming, I mean, you know, he is trying to be the smartest guy in the room, figuring out these premiums, which they've been successful doing. And, you know, he's achieving these huge prices for his credits. That's fine. And we could talk about a handful of other deals out there too, where they're doing different things around reforestation and what have you. Um, that's not the game here. The game here is literally uh, to buy to the stock and, and um, express a view around the move of the average carbon price. And so, you know, I think it'll be a great, a great tool in a basket or in a portfolio for people who are interested in the carbon space. So walk me through the details a little bit. So you buy the credits, hold them, and, and then what? And then it trades. Just it's going to trade on a on an MPV. It's going to it's going to look just exactly like the Sprott Uranium Trust. Okay. Now, who do you buy the credits? Who are you going to buy the credits from? Well, look, I I, um, I started buying and selling credits, you know, a couple of years ago. PA. I mean, like one of my greatest trades I've ever had. PA was was buying these <laughs> buying these credits a couple of years ago. Uh, but you know, in that process. Um, we made relationships with, or I've made relationships with all the various brokers and, and dealers of these credits. And, you know, keep in mind, um, we're only buying Vera credits and, and some gold standard credits such that, you know, if, if you're a retail investor and you're sitting here right now saying, I want to invest in carbon, you know, right now, to my knowledge, there's really only one public name and that's carbon streaming. I think base carbon is public in the next couple quarters. And I know there's like 10 other ones, but all of those, you're ultimately putting your trust in a management team to execute a business plan. And I can tell you, once you start getting into most of these guys' business plans, like they don't, they don't know what they're doing because they've never done it before. Now that's fine, like because that's how you get a ten bagger somewhere in there. But um, what this product is ultimately meant to do is allow you to speculate specifically on the price of carbon moving. So yeah. there's no business plan other than owning carbon credits, which you can't do. If I say, Jay, hey, go buy a carbon credit, like good, good luck, right? 
And then even better luck if you manage to buy one, good luck selling it. And so uh, this is going to be an exchange traded product um, that uh, will allow a retail investor to speculate long and short. So it's a proxy to own the price of carbon credits, correct? 100%. 100%. Yeah. And you know, uh, people will outperform, right? Like uh, you, there will be names where they will do something special and they're going to outperform everyone. But it kind of comes back to my philosophy of investing, which is, you know, you should own the GDXJ as well as some specific names. You know, you should own the first quantum as well as some specific copper names and so on. So I think that's, uh, it kind of just matches philosophically how I think about um, the space where a lot of stuff can go wrong. Okay. Now, stepping back from the investment opportunity and talking about, I guess, the, the bigger picture, if you want to call it that. Does this market, does the existence of this market and the trading of carbon credits, does it actually make an environmental impact? Does it reduce emissions in your opinion? Or is this just a market? Okay, so the idea, the, the, the basic idea, of course, is that as carbon gets more and more expensive, uh, the emitter will change their behavior because they'll become too expensive to, to have that behavior. I mean, like it's a tax, right? So that's the basic idea. So uh, in so much as you believe that uh, as carbon becomes more and more expensive, people will change their behaviors, which I think is the case. Uh, fundamentally, nature-based solutions do change. I mean, if you uh, reforest a hundred thousand acres, like you reforested it, you, you know, if you that's called additionality, which is important for these credits, you're doing something additional. Like just as a side note, if if someone shows up and um, they've got a hundred thousand acres of forested land and it's government crown land that can never be cut, you can't write credits on that because it can't be cut down, right? Okay. However, if you showed up with 100,000 acres of, of forest land that could be cut down, you could write credits on that. Uh, there's a little nuance there. So my, my point is there's no, there's no question mm -hmm. that, um, that reforestation, avoiding for deforestation, uh, some of the green stuff around mangroves, there's no question that that's helping the environment. Um, and this is all just a transition, right? Like this is just a segue into something different 20 or 30 years from now, because you can't just decarbonize, right? So uh, I think that this is a transition period here, 20, 30 years. Okay. And uh, it's a way of taxing that transition. And I think the basic idea is that, you know, at carbon at 200 versus carbon at 10, uh, if you're an emitter, you're going to think about, you're going to think about what it is that you can do to change your process. So, um, yeah, that's how I think about it. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Now, I want to get into uh, the various types of carbon credits, just because I'm curious. You mentioned nature-based solutions. Uh, you mentioned blue credits. So those two different types, and then uh, more ambiguous or maybe niche like switching fuel sources. Or you said, you know, so those are all those are all carbon credits that they have to meet the Vera standard. So a metric ton of reforestation is the same as a metric ton of switching fuel as hydro as as blue as mangrove they're all the same metric ton okay um the difference uh i think is how sexy are they to the end buyer of them right yeah how marketable are they how marketable are that that's really once they fit into the various standard like then the mm -hmm. question and, and this kind of comes back to this idea of charismatic credits and premiums and it's why I avoid it. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the smartest guy in the room here. Um, I, I think people can be the smartest guys and gals in the room, um, and there certainly will be. And Justin Cochran has proved, you know, that team with that Rim Bariah deal and with the way those credits are trading. Um, uh, I actually saw, I saw an offer today at fifteen fifty. So like that worked for them, but that's not what I'm doing because it's just easier to pick the average because a high tide floats all boats and. You know, you can still speculate on the move without having to be like super smart about picking the premiums, which comes back to this point. If you're a retail investor looking at these deals, you know, if they're telling, if you can see the baseline carbon price is eight bucks and they're going to tell you they're going to get 20 bucks, like you better really, really believe that they're going to do that because most likely they're not. Most likely they're going to get eight bucks if they get registered at all. And I think that's, um, you know, that's where I think the disappointment will come in. If I think about, um, in general, if you have the land and you have the ability to make the credits, you'll, you'll probably get there if you have the money to get yourself through that process, the, you know, the millions of dollars. Where I think the disappointment for the real disappointment besides just general like 
scamming. Uh, I think the real disappointment can come from, you know, being wrong about your management team's ability to like achieve a carbon price that isn't the average. Okay. Now I want to follow up on something else you mentioned earlier, and I'm, I might bastardize this. So you just correct me uh, as, as you need to, but you said in order to, to meet the demand of all the carbon credits required, I guess we have to reforest the entire planet like three or four times over. So the arable land, I mean, yeah, like, the like I've read that. I'm not, I'm not telling you that's a hundred percent true, but what it illustrates is the point that, um, we can't do it just through nature-based solution carbon credits. That's what I'm looking for. So yeah, I wanted to get to that supply and demand dynamic, right? So could this be, and would this be a catalyst therefore for some new like reclamation technologies? That's something you expect in the future is new. Well, there, there, there are lots of people doing this. I mean, there's a major billions and billions of dollars are being spent on this. And my kind of point was that today you probably need a hundred dollar at least carbon price for those, or maybe even $150 carbon price. And some of it is $300 even. Uh, in other words, the technology doesn't work yet. I mean, it works in lab, but I, I think where we, where we get to is a carbon price that allows the mechanical capture to work. And by doing that, of course, you know, as that carbon price goes higher and higher and higher, um, I think the hope and the idea of the system is to uh, incentivize companies to move towards less carbon intensive ways of operating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which is great. I mean, this is like the, probably the only time I can say that uh, I've made a lot of money making money. I think these ideas are going to make even the ideas that aren't, aren't ours, that are, of all these ideas are going to make people a lot of money, but you're also helping the environment. I mean, especially on the nature-based solution credits, it's just pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Okay. Now, um let's dive into i want to understand mechanical capture a little bit okay. so what, what is that exactly okay so there, there's different uh there's different technologies but the basic idea is that you have a scrubber in the air and as the air flows through the scrubber it pulls the carbon out and you know in some ideas they push it down into the ground or they turn it into glass or you know there's uh, countless different like um uh, ideas about how people are going to do that. And even the oil companies are working on it. Um, you know, I, and I, I would predict that very shortly there will be any number of uh, mechanical carbon capture deals coming to the equity markets. And for me, I just don't invest in them. Uh, I, I think that, I think they can, you know what I would say it's analogous to, it's analogous to investing in lithium, but only investing in brineless extraction. Like someday brineless extraction will, will work and they'll just suck it out of the ground and you won't have to have those big ponds out there. Like that's going to happen someday, but tens of billions of dollars will be spent in the meantime, figuring it out. And, and so for me, that's kind of how I think about carbon capture. Like it's definitely going to work. It's definitely 100% going to work, but you know, probably tens, and if not hundreds of billions of dollars will get torched first. So uh, as an investor, it's just not, it's not where I'm going personally. And I, I would just say, you know, if that's the way you want to go really Think long and hard about it because I would say there's going to be more zeros in that space than there will be in, mm. um, in you know, some of the other carbon type deals. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay. Look, Anthony, I feel like uh, I'm a lot smarter than I was 45 minutes ago when it comes to the carbon market. <laughs> and by the way, we could talk for another hour. I mean, there's a lot of nuance too around like, where do the carbon credits originate? And like, do you want to offset your operations is where they originate? I mean, there's so much, so much nuance to it. And you know, if you're an investor and you're watching this, I, I would just say uh, you should get exposure. There's no question. But if, if you're thinking about an early stage deal, uh, I would just, just really, um, I'd really think about that management team and make sure. And even if you're going to put a real check in there, make sure that you uh, have a lot of comfort that they know what they're doing because there is a lot of nuance here. And um, I think you can get it wrong pretty easily. Yeah. And it always comes back to that. I mean, I harp on that on my channel all day long. You know, we're just talking basic uh, development, exploration. You know, it's it's just, it's people over everything every single time. That's what I tell everybody every day. And, and uh, you know, because I can't, I invest in the commodity sector in addition to many others, but I can't be a geologist. I can't be a mining engineer. But you can check people, you know, anybody can do that. Anybody can check them. You know, the other thing too that I always teach you that I think every investor should ask is what check did you write? The CEO, the chairman, mm -hmm. what, tell me what cash check, not what free shares you got, not what shares you got at a half cent, 
or yeah. two cents. This is the dollar fifty round. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But but to me, like you you have some promoter on your at your door, and you know that the guys are twenty or thirty million bucks because you can just see from his. And uh, he says, "Oh, I got a couple million dollars of stock." It's like, well, yeah, because you did it at a nickel and you pumped it up. But I would just say, um, for all names, but in particular this, I would just say, hey, like, what was your check? Like, what check did you cash right? You know, and um, for me, you know, that would be really helpful to know that this guy who's worth thirty million dollars, I'm making up the number, you know, wrote a million dollar check, right? But if he's worth thirty million bucks and he got a hundred thousand dollars of cheap stock that are worth two million bucks right now, like. Like, does that guy really care? Like what, you know? So I think that's um, actual outlay of, of money, real money, I think is a pretty important um, thing. And then the other one is, are, are you participate, the person pitching it to you? Are you participating in this round? How much? Yeah. Uh, I think those for me are really important questions. <laughs> Well, yeah, hundred percent. And that's just a, a golden rule in general. Absolutely. You should always find out. And uh just recently, actually, I was being pitched on a, a private tech deal by a first time entrepreneur who's very, very bright. And I had a lot of confidence in and we were going over the terms. And my question for him was, how much have you raised from friends and family? And his response was, well, you know, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable asking friends and family for money. <laughs> and so, uh, well, if you don't want to be uncomfortable, why the fuck are you being? <laughs> don't be not a yeah. parent. Just don't do it. <laughs> exactly. Why are you asking me then? Um, okay, look, uh, Anthony, this has been fascinating. Uh, we covered the big themes that I wanted to. And so where can people, where should people go? They want to learn more about you or about the market. Where would you, where would you point them? Um, I, you know, tw- I mean, me personally, I'm on Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter. I think that's the best place. Um, uh, I, I've ri- if you Google my name and carbon, I've written some kind of just, I don't know, you can find it. It's all kind of free out there. I've written some basics, but you can, you can DM me, um, on, on Twitter as well. Um, always happy to talk about about the market and, and the development of the market. So uh, I think that's pretty easy. <clears throat> okay. And it's a underscore Malowski on Twitter. That'll be in the, in the uh, description. Is that, is it, I, it might be, I don't even know what my name is. <laughs> I'll pull up my Twitter right now. Sorry. That's what I got in my prep sheet here, but you tell me if that's wrong. No, I probably is right. I don't even know. Fine. Certainly, if you uh, if you Google if you Google my name and Twitter, like it comes up. So, oh yeah, Andrew Scrumless. Okay, so you you know, all right. That's excellent. I love it. All right, brother. Well, look, it was a pleasure chatting. I'd love to do this again. And and because yeah, this- thanks. Anytime we get on, we, you know, this market is changing so quickly that um, yeah, talking in four or five months, and it'd probably be a different different conversation. Yeah, part two is probably a great idea. All right, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Bye. Hey guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.